Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I have a bit of a different video for you. Something that was very much unplanned, but I think it's interesting and worth exploring in this video. So while I do have some updated 7950X 3D versus 1300K results, the focus is on the issue that I ran into while updating my Core i9 data using a Z790 motherboard. But before we get to that, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Hetzner, a reliable hosting partner with a passion for IT. Hetzner runs their own high-tech data centers in Helsinki, Finland, as well as German cities Nuremberg and Falkenstein. By merging its capabilities in cutting-edge technology, attractive pricing and skilled customer service, Hetzner has also increased its market share both inside and outside of Europe. As one of the leading hosting providers, Hetzner is still innovating when it comes to new products, offering a variety of services. Outstanding self-developed, high-tech dedicated servers such as their recent launch of the EX44 featuring Intel's Core i5-13500 and EX101 using Intel's Core i9-13900. So for affordable approaches to modernizing your IT infrastructure, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so if you watched my recent 13900K DDR5 memory scaling and tuning video, You'll recall that I mentioned there were a few instances where the Gigabyte Z790 motherboard that I was using for that content piece was a good bit faster than the MSI board that I had been using. Now, some of the performance discrepancies can be solely attributed to Gigabyte's use of slightly more aggressive memory timings, but there were also a few very significant performance margins that went well beyond the difference that could be attributed to memory timings. So I wanted to set aside some time to look into this issue, and having now done that, well, you're getting this bonus video. So without wasting any more time, let's get into the data and I'll explain further what's going on. For all Intel results, I've used the Core i9-13900K with DDR5 7200CL34 memory using XMP. Then for the graphics card, we have the GeForce RTX 4090 and all of the data is 100% fresh for this content. So let's get into it. First off, we have the Rift Breaker and everything looks pretty well right here. Gigabyte, ASUS, ASRock and MSI, all delivered roughly the same level of performance. There is some variation in memory timings used by each brand, but nothing significant enough to heavily influence the data. Also, if you're wondering why there are two gigabyte boards here, well, that'll become clear a little bit later on. Here we have shot of the Tomb Raider, and these results are much the same with no more than a 1% deviation in the results. The Callisto Protocol, also much the same here. We're seeing up to a 2% difference between the fastest and slowest Z790 boards. And there's basically no difference in performance in Watch Dogs Legion either. All boards were within one FPS of one another. And then we're seeing much the same in a Plague Tale Requiem, no more than a 2% performance difference between these Z790 motherboards. Therefore, given what we've seen in the five games we just looked at, these results are pretty puzzling and initially were rather concerning. This is because initially I'd only gathered data with the MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi, the board we use in our test system, so finding the Aorus Elite AX to be 17% faster than average in Horizon Zero Dawn with 25% greater 1% lows was a concerning discovery. Now, having triple checked the game settings for both boards, I was puzzled as to what was going on here. So I tried a second gigabyte board, the ROG, and found the same result as the Aorus Elite AX. So maybe this was just an MSI Z790 issue. However, after testing boards from both ASUS and ASRock, this didn't appear to be the case. Now, it might have been a situation where there was some kind of bug in Horizon Zero Dawn, but that's not the case, as this wasn't the only game to exhibit this strange behavior. For example, we found that the Gigabyte boards were also much faster in Spider-Man Remastered, around 14% in this example, and this difference was too large to simply chalk up to memory timings. So, having triple checked the data and confirmed it was accurate, I went hunting for answers. After several hours of messing around with settings, Windows installations, BIOS revisions, and so on, I found the answer. And it's a remarkably straightforward answer, but it wasn't something I expected to be the problem. It wasn't something I was on the lookout for, and the reason being that we are using Z790 motherboards. So the issue was that by default, Gigabyte disables resizable bar on their Z790 motherboards, whereas ASUS, ASRock, and MSI all enable it. And this causes some strange issues when using GeForce GPUs, as the RTX 4090 is much slower with resizable bar enabled in Horizon Zero Dawn and Spider-Man Remastered, at least on an Intel platform. And here's a look at Spider-Man Remastered, and it's the same story. Disabling rebar on the MSI boards solves the performance issues seen previously, while enabling it on the Gigabyte boards lowers performance to the same level seen on the ASUS, ASRock, and MSI boards. 
And just for a quick sanity check, here's another look at Shut Off the Tomb Raider with and without rebar enabled. Basically, you're looking at the same performance. And it's the same story in Watch Dogs Legion, which explains why most games saw little to no performance difference between these various motherboard brands. Now here's a look at how the Ryzen 9 7950X 3D using DDR5 6000 CL30 memory on the Aorus Master compares to the Core i9 13900K with DDR5 7200 CL34 memory on the Aorus Elite, both with rebar enabled and disabled. In this example, using the Rift Breaker, we see the 13900K delivered roughly the same level of performance with and without rebar, while the 7950X 3D was 5% faster with rebar enabled. And that meant the 13900K was 1-2% faster, depending on the configuration. We find a similar thing in Shut Off the Tomb Raider. Here the 13900K saw no real performance change with or without rebar enabled, but the 7950X 3D was 8% faster with rebar on, making it 5% faster than the 13900K, or 3% slower without the aid of resizable bar. Performance in the Callisto protocol was much the same on both platforms, regardless of whether or not resizable bar was enabled or disabled. And as an example, we see that the 7950X 3D's average frame rate was 2% greater, with a 6% improvement to 1% lows. And here we have another example in Watch Dogs Legion, where the 13900K delivered the same level of performance with or without rebar enabled. Meanwhile, the 7950X 3D saw a mild 3% boost with the technology turned on, making it 14% faster than the 13900K in this example. Like Watch Dogs Legion, the 13900K saw no change in performance with rebar enabled in A Plague Tale Requiem, whereas the 7950X 3D, that saw a 5% boost, allowing it to match the 13900K, though in this example 1% lows were still 7% lower with the Ryzen processor. Now, the Horizon Zero Dawn results are again very interesting. With rebar disabled, both CPUs produced their best results, and here the 7950X 3D led by an 11% margin. However, with rebar enabled on both platforms, the 7950X 3D is now 25% faster, giving the AMD processor a much larger performance advantage. Basically, resizable bar on the 4090 only reduced the 7950X 3D's performance by 4%, whereas the 13900K was 15% slower. And it's a similar situation with Spider-Man Remastered. The 7950X 3D was 4% faster with rebar disabled, while the 13900K was 14% faster, making the 7950X 3D 6% faster than the Core i9 processor once we enabled resizable bar, but then 3% slower with it disabled. I'm so glad that I used a Gigabyte board for our recent Intel memory scaling and tuning video because had I stuck with the MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi, I would have never discovered this configuration issue. It's really interesting because a few of you who do use Intel processors have in the past noted better scores in Horizon Zero Dawn's benchmark when compared to what we've been reporting. But after numerous retests, I was never able to replicate those results. And it's likely those of you who were seeing the better results were using a gigabyte board or had manually disabled resizable bar. On that note, we only started testing exclusively with resizable bar about a year ago after being pressured into doing so. We were initially hesitant to jump on the resizable bar bus given how many odd results we'd found in our testing, and overall it didn't appear to make that much difference. Sure, there were some games that did benefit a lot, but there were some that didn't, and as I said, overall, the results really did remain much the same. But with AM5 and LJ1700 boards electing to enable resizable bar by default, the change was inevitable. So for all platforms that did support the technology, we made sure that it was enabled. On the AM5 front, for example, we've tested just about every single X670 and B650 board that there is, and with the current BIOS revisions that were available at the time of testing, all did enable resizable bar by default, including the X670E Aorus Master that we use in our AM5 test system. And this was also true for our LJ1700 test system, which used the MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi. And of course, as we've now discovered, the only exception here being Gigabyte's Z790 range. So when using our current modern test systems on the AM5 and LJ1700 platforms, I don't automatically check to see if resizable bar is enabled, as it should be enabled by default. And I've not had any problems to date, other than of course running into these Gigabyte Z790 motherboards. For older test systems though, like our AM4 test system, I do check to see if resizable bar is enabled, as I generally have to manually enable that setting, as it's not enabled by default. Now it's really important to note that resizable bar is not a feature that you can just freely enable or disable within Windows. Instead, you'll have to completely reboot the system, enter the BIOS, and then adjust it there. 
So this isn't a setting that you'd enable for one game and then disable for another. At least that's not very practical. And realistically, it's probably gonna be a setting that you'll just set and forget. Or in most instances on a modern system, you'll actually just never touch it. So that being the case, we're not gonna enable rebar for some games and disable it for others, as basically no gamer is ever gonna do that. That being the case, I'd by preference stick to the configuration that we're currently using, and that's the configuration used by MSI, ASUS, and ASRock. And of course, that being to enable resizable bar by default, leaving it up to NVIDIA to sort out their resizable bar support, something they seem unable to do, despite claiming that they'd only use the feature when it was of benefit. But of course, let me know what you think in the comments section. Should we test LJ1700 processors with or without rebar enabled? And keep in mind there are some games where the feature is of great benefit for Intel users. It's also worth keeping in mind that if you do see large performance discrepancies between reviews for certain games, it's worth taking a look at the motherboard used and noting if resizable bar was enabled or not, plus the various other things that could affect results such as memory configurations, the games used like are they testing the same game in the same way? Uh, are they using a CAN benchmark versus custom benchmark passes? A lot of things there can influence the results. But I guess the point I'm probably trying to make here is that they're probably not paid shills. They're just using a configuration that might not be the most optimal for a given game, despite making the most sense overall. And I'll leave it at that for now. Let me know how you think Intel's LJ1700 processor should be tested, and I'll be sure to read your comments. If you enjoyed the video, well, thank you. Give it one of those. Also, subscribe for more content, and you can get a lot more Harbour Box goodness via our Floatplane and Patreon accounts. Signing up to either one of those will give you access to our exclusive Discord server for members only, monthly live stream. Tim and I get together and answer your questions live. We have a behind the scenes uh, content, lots of that. Uh, and what else do we do? Q&As. So there's some cool stuff there. Check it out if you're interested, but if not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.